Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for coming here today. So imagine that you've worked on the infrastructure of a very, very complex system for more than a year, and within half an hour into a penetration test, your whole production cluster gets completely compromised. We're talking being able to bypass Google Cloud services that you shouldn't have access to, all from within a teeny tiny container. In a day and age in which no security control is completely impenetrable, I will be taking you through the journey of, in a way, becoming compliant as a financial institution, but more importantly, talking about our setup in the Kubernetes and Google Cloud work, world and what you can take away from it if you have a similar setup. So, who am I? My name is Anna Colleen, and I'm a systems engineer at Paybase. The things I'm going to cover today, well, first of all, I'll give you a bit of context about Paybase, who we are, we are and what we do. Then we'll have a look at some of the things we've achieved so far as a company. Then I'll talk you through our tech stack, and then I'll give you a bit more details about this compromise. Um, then we'll have a look at some of the lessons learned about security and resilience in the Kubernetes world. And we'll talk a bit about some of the challenges we've circumvented through our specific setup. And although this helped us with compliance, any company could take them away and use them. So Paybase is an API-driven payment services provider that offers a business-to-business -business model. Our typical customers are marketplaces, gig sharing economies, cryptocurrencies, and any type of platform businesses that uh, connect a um, buyer to a seller. Um, and this type of uh, businesses have been, um, nowadays, uh, they, they face a lot of technical complexities, but on top of that, they um, see themselves in a situation in which, due to updated regulation, they have to either become a regulated payment institution they, themselves, or they have to integrate with a payments institution. Now, the current solutions that exist out there are costly and inflexible. So we're trying to build, well, we have built a product that addresses these issues. And that's, that's why we came about. Some of the things we've achieved so far, we are under two years old, and we have built our own processing platform from scratch. We're currently in the process of um, onboarding our first seven clients, and we're in no shortage of demand. We are FCA authorized, so that's Financial Conduct Authority, and we have an electronic money institution license. And in 2017, we have received an Innovate UK grant worth of 700,000 pounds in order to democratize e-money for startups and SMEs. And least, but definitely not last, we are PCI DSS level one compliant, which um, is no small feat given that the current status of the PCI DSS standard is one such that a lot of businesses, especially big financial institutions, choose to pay annual fines rather than comply. And this is due to their technical complexity, the hundreds of applications that, uh, the hundred legacy applications that they have, um, and uh, well, the sheer, uh, the sheer complexity of their whole business and their size as well. So, our tech stack. Uh, our application is a distributed monolith separated by entities, and we've done this so that we have a capacity to, to scale easily and um, um, to troubleshoot easily as well. However, our infrastructure um, is a, a microservices-based infrastructure. So in terms of the infrastructure stack, everything is bu built on top of Google Cloud Platform. Um, all of the infrastructure is provisioned as infrastructure of, as code with Terraform. And we use Kubernetes 
uh, and specifically we use the GKE, so Google Kubernetes Engine uh, Managed Kubernetes Solution from Google Cloud. Um, and everything runs in Docker containers and we wrap everything around with Helm. And I'll tell you about Helm in a bit. In terms of monitoring, uh, we have two different monitoring stacks. We use EFK, so Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana for low collection. And we use Prometheus and Grafana for metric ag aggregation. And we have set these two systems up in such a way so that if one of them becomes unavailable, let's say Elasticsearch decides to no longer play nicely, then Prometheus would alert us about it. In terms of the application itself, it is a distributed monolith, but it is written mainly on JavaScript. And, um, but we use protobuf as an um, interface definition language because that allows us to rewrite any part of the application in any other programming language if we need to, if we wish to. The communication between the services is done um, over synchronously over gRPC using HTTP2. And we use NSQ as a distributed messaging platform. That's our tech stack. There's, it's much more complex than that, but this is some of the bits that everyone can understand and take away, rather than me showing you loads of squiggly lines and things that are connected to each other. So, you know who we are, you know a bit about our tech stack. Let me tell you what really happened with our compromise. But first of all, it was in the scope of an internal infrastructure penetration test. It was in our production cluster, but at the time, no customers were using the production cluster. And um, the penetration tester had access into our uh, cluster through a privileged container. So it wasn't a full compromise uh, in, the, in the way in which the penetration tester managed to compromise it from the outside. So what should you be aware of in the event you have a similar setup? Well, first of all, GKE, so Google Kubernetes Engine, comes with certain defaults that are not necessarily 100% secure. Now, this per these particular examples were valid up until version 1.12 of GKE, that's the current version. But if you were to bring up a container cluster uh, a few months ago, uh, maybe, maybe even a month ago, the things that you'd get by default would be the compute engine scope enabled, the compute engine default service account enabled, and legacy metadata endpoints enabled. Now the compute engine scope is an OAuth scope, which is a access scope that allows different Google services to talk to each other. So in our case, GKE would be able to talk to the Google compute engine service. So if you are, uh, so on, the, on this side, um, you can see the Terraform documentation that tells you that the following scopes are necessary to ensure the correct functionality of a cluster. And the very first one is compute read-write. Now Terraform recently updated their documentation and they taken out the compute read-write scope, but this was only a couple of weeks ago. So this was one of the bits that exposed us to the compromise. Second thing, uh, the GKE container cluster comes enabled with the compute engine default service account. The compute engine default service account is a service account that Google Cloud creates for you in the moment you are provisioning a new project. And this service account is associated with the editor role, which means that this service account has access to do, uh, to edit anything there is with your project, your Google project. By virtue of your GKE nodes um, having the service account, uh, it means that if you manage to compromise um, from a, a container into a node, um, you have access, uh, you have editor access into your Google Cloud um, project. That means. Uh, being able to access storage and files and 
basically remove everything if that's what you want, or install everything if that's what you want. And um, the final bit in terms of GKE, it's um, legacy metadata endpoints is enabled by default. So what this means is that by querying the metadata endpoints of a node within GKE, you get access uh, at the Kubernetes API as the kubelet, which means you are able to read any secrets associated with Kubernetes from within a pod or um, a node in GKE, which means you can remove the whole application and do whatever you want again. Depends how malicious you are. And this is an example of what you can do if you, want, if you have GKE and you want to check whether this is enabled. And if you are on a version um, lower than 1.12, because GKE recently disabled this option by default, um, you should apply either the first option in terms of with G Cloud, or if you're using Terraform, you can add the following block um, into your Terraform configuration, into the node config. And this is the result that you should be uh, getting. You should be seeing that the metadata endpoint is concealed. Okay, that was GKE. The second um, potential attack vector can be Helm, depending on how you've configured it. So Helm is, um, is a piece of functionality that helps you package Kubernetes resources in um, small applications that we call charts and, um, gets you, uh, and lets you reuse them and template in a very nice way. And the way it works is that it has a client which you install on your machine locally, the Helm client, and into the Kubernetes cluster, you install um, a, another piece of functionality called Tiller, and this is where the problem lies. If you um, accept all of the default settings for Tiller, you get MTLS disabled by default, um, and there is no authentication uh, performed by default. And this can be a problem because Tiller, in order to function properly, it needs to have access to the cluster admin into a Kubernetes cluster, which means that it, it is able to, uh, to deal with any type of Kubernetes um, of resources and Kubernetes API in the cluster. Now, uh, we knew that we shouldn't leave the default options. In fact, we were planning to do that. However, when it came to the penetration test, we, we wanted to see to what extent the penetration tester um, can uh, compromise our cluster, if they can, leaving these um, options uh, as they are. And they could do a lot of things. Um, so I have provisioned a random uh, pod into my cluster. And um, I have um, the Helm uh, server installed with it. And as you can see, if I run Helm version, it tells me that it cannot list any pods um, into the cube system, which makes sense. However, if I tell net directly into the address of Tiller, all of a sudden, I am connected to the Tiller server, and I can do whatever I want from here that Tiller can do. And this is from a pod that, um, that's in a completely different namespace from Tiller. So what should you do to mitigate this? Well, first of all, you should uh, enable MTLS. However, if for whatever reason you're unable to, at the very, very minimum, you should tie uh, Tiller to localhost and by doing this, you're ensuring that um, only the IP address associated with the Tiller pod um, receives connections uh, to do with Tiller. And to see what the results are, as you can see in my screenshot, um, when I'm trying to tell net the same address, I can now see unable to connect to remote host. So those were the two main um, issues 
that um, caused us a compromise. Let's have a look at some uh, other security and resilience best practices in a Kubernetes cluster that anyone can, um, can apply. A secure Kubernetes cluster should uh, use a dedicated service account with minimal permissions. Um, service account if you're using GCP, principal, uh, service principal if you're using Azure. A Kubernetes um, secure cluster should um, use minimal scope, so think, uh, think about list privileged principles, and definitely don't use that compute read write uh, scope. You don't need it. Your cluster will work just fine. You should use network policies or Istio enabled with authorization rules set up in order to um, restrict traffic to certain groups of um, pods that might be more privileged than others. Um, into the cluster. So in that case, um, it could be Tiller because it's running as, as cluster admin, or it could be your Istio pods if you're using Istio. You should use pod security policies so that uh, you ensure that your containers um, and your pods uh, have uh, only certain, uh, are ever built with only certain um, privileges. For example, they are unable to mount into the host system. Um, and copy everything that is on your nodes. You should use scanned images, and I'll touch upon this in a bit. And um, you should have RBAC enabled, so um, role-based access control. Now, um, most Kubernetes managed services, so GCP, Azure, um, AKS, and um, uh, the AWS version, um, they all have RBAC enabled by default. However, if you're using Azure and you haven't upgraded your clusters in a while, it wasn't an, uh, enabled until uh, the second half of last year. What's a resilient Kubernetes cluster? Well, a resilient Kubernetes cluster should always be architected with failure and, uh, and elasticity in mind by default. It should have an um, observability stack or monitoring stack, um, and um, try to test it with tools such as chaos engineering. Now, I know that most of us, especially if you're administering a cluster, you might be super scared of touching um, a tool such as chaos engineering. I was until I used it. Um, in order to install it, you only need to use one command if you have Helm installed and is this command here. And you can either run it um, as a dry run or you can um, run it as is. And what this will do is it will uh, randomly start killing pods um, into your cluster. And that way you can see how your cluster behaves under unexpected um, load or um, how it fails, basically. We found this uh, to be a very good way of uh, testing the resilience of your cluster, especially if you're using um, software such as Elasticsearch, which runs on JVM. And um, we know that JVM is no fun. OK, so I've told you a bit about what we do, a bit about our tech stack, a bit about how to avoid getting in a situation um, that we haven't been in, uh, that um, we've gotten ourselves in. Let me tell you very briefly about some of the challenges we've circumvented on our roads to compliance. And I've, I've set this up in a, in a PCI sort of manner, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't take this away. So as a PCI compliant payment services provider, I am required to remove all test data and accounts from system components before the system becomes active or goes into production. Now, the normal way in which um, most organizations would um, set up their cloud, set, uh, their cloud um, resources would be under one main organization, and then you would have uh, one main project or account if you are talking AWS, and then you'd have everything, uh, every single environment uh, within that project. So in our case, if you 
as you can see in this picture, the uh, Google Kubernetes engine would have um, the environment separated at the namespace uh, level. And then you'd have the different um, other services that you need to talk to. Now, if you're doing this as part of PCI DSS, that means that um, your CD, which is the cardholder data environment, which is everything you need to audit and test, becomes every single service of Google Cloud. And from a security point of view, it also means that if you've managed to compromise one of the services, so GKE, with what, what happened in our system, then you would have managed to compromise all of the services. So we're talking about our images, our container images, our Terraform state, which was holding all of the infrastructure state, and all of our backups. And of course, the backups are very, very precious, and we don't want that. So we didn't have to deal with this problem, because actually, our way of splitting environments looks like this. So we have a project for every single environment and um, because we, we wrote, uh, write it with Terraform, it's very easy to ensure that everything looks the same. And then we have separate projects for those really, really important things that we want to keep away from an attacker in the event that they manage to compromise one of the projects. So in our case, um, again, Terraform state, backups, and other stuff. And um, from a PCA point of view, that means that our, what we're testing, the CD, the cardholder data environment, becomes much more smaller. And that really helped us. Um, so what does that give us? It gives us better security. It gives us separation of concerns. It gives us reduction of scope and easier to organize our back as well. Challenge number two. As a PCI compliant payment services provider, I am required to perform quarterly internal vulnerability scans, address vulnerabilities, and perform risk scans to verify all high risk vulnerabilities are resolved in accordance to the entity's vulnerability uh, ranking. Now, now, in the container world, it, especially in the same cluster, you don't have that much the idea of an of internal infrastructure. So the way we manage to address this from a compliance point of view, and the way any secure company should address this, um, would be via image scanning. So image scanning means that you're checking um, an image for the software packages and the binaries and all of the other packages to ensure that there are no vulnerabilities out there. And um, the way we've done this is by building the scan as a step into our continuous integration um, flow. So what that means is that a new image, once all of the tests pass, is built. If, um, if the image is built successfully, the next step is to scan the image by a different step. And if the scan uh, passes, so that means it has vulnerabilities um, low, um, lower than medium, and then the built image is re uh, retrieved and then it's pushed into a um, container repository. However, if the image scan step fails, that means that the build stops there and someone has to go um, and um, fix the vulnerabilities into that image. So, I'm aware that I have very little left. I'd like to summarize by saying that security is not a point in time, but an ongoing journey, especially in this day and age. You can use open source software. In fact, our whole system is more than 90% uh, built on open source and still achieve a good level of security and still be compliant with, uh, if, if I can say, very outdated regulations. Um, however, you need to keep on top of everything you do. I will invite you to ask me questions now. Um, however, before I do that, um, I've added some resources if you want to test your Kubernetes clusters. And we are hiring. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that here, but I am. So come and talk to me if uh, you're interested. And um, 
Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Um, yeah, you are. Uh, well, Google Cloud is not open source. Um, the incident management tool that we use is not open source. Um, and then a few things around, um, uh, so we are required by PCI DSS to do external vulnerability scans, and that has to be done by, an, uh, uh, they're called the proof scanning vendors. Those are those are basically the things that we don't uh, that are not open source. Pretty much everything else is open source. Yes, yeah. So that's uh, distributed event messaging. It allows for a synchronous, um, yeah, event messaging, and that's open source as well. Um, so before I actually joined the company, um, the company was using AWS, but then um, the main reason why they, they moved to Google Cloud was because of the whole Kubernetes piece, and at the time, uh, about two years ago, um, the best Kubernetes managed service, and even now the best Kubernetes managed service is Google Cloud. And um, if you think of, um, well, managing Kubernetes is really, really hard um, without having to administer it. Uh, so th the main reason was around the, uh, the fact that it's Kubernetes, uh, that we're using Kubernetes. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much for joining. Have a nice day.